Hey. Today I want to look at why glass is transparent. Or is it? We take the clarity of window glass in our houses for granted almost. But it's worth taking a step backwards and maybe looking at why this amazing material has the transparency that it does. And one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is just how transparent glass really is. In a thin sheet like a window pane it's relatively easy to call the material transparent. But I have a little device here which might help to show us the limitations of the transparency of glass. It's essentially a glass rod with a couple of other glass tubes around it. Three different formulations uh, of glass in fact. But the interesting thing is to hold it end on to the camera and you'll notice that the rod in the middle uh, actually takes on a sort of greeny blue colour uh, to the camera. It's far from uh, transparent, indeed it's actually got colour to it, although you'd never tell by looking at this tubing uh, from the side. It looks, you know, really quite clear apart from the refraction effects which bend the light a little bit like a lens. Um, and around it the two different sort of glasses, you probably won't be able to see this clearly on the camera, uh, but we're not going to see through those end on either. Uh, and we're not going to see through them because we're now travelling through uh, about, I don't know, 25 centimetres worth of, of glass rather than a few millimetres. And that makes all the difference. So this is a highly transparent material, but it's not perfectly transparent by any means. And that's really the sort of area that I think we should explore a little bit more uh, in this video. It'll tell us a lot about glass as a material. Well, we've talked about uh, the transparency of window panes and so on. Uh, and in the clips you've seen, I showed you this construction, um, which was uh, simply a metal rod around which um, there are a couple of tubes of different sorts of, of glass. OK. Uh, and that illustrates, I think, both the transparency of glass and its limitations. But we need to look at the physics of all this. What actually is happening here? Well, you know, light, when it reaches an object, can do uh, various things. So the metal surround around this uh, whiteboard, for instance, is highly reflective. The light is being bounced off. The white surface of the whiteboard, of course, also is a fairly reflective um, surface. If I take the eraser for this whiteboard, however, uh, it's not reflecting a lot of light. It's actually looking black. And what are the differences here? Well, the differences come down to the various things that light can do when it reaches an object. It can be absorbed, so the light in this case will end up being converted into heat energy. It can be reflected, as in the case of this metal surround to the whiteboard, and to a lesser extent the whiteboard itself. Or it can be transmitted, as we've seen in the case of, um, of glass. And all three things can happen, and they're all to do with the electrons uh, inside each of these materials and how they make uh, the material different in terms of its response to light falling upon it. So when light hits a metal it tends to scatter the light, the electrons in the metal tend to scatter the light backwards. So in the reverse direction, not precisely but mostly in the reverse direction uh, from which they came. So we're getting light coming back at us uh, in that way. Um, a 
silvered or actually aluminium coated sheet of glass, something we would normally hang on our walls as a mirror, does that extremely well. There's a very smooth surface of metal then, uh, so actually we do get the light uh, uh, bounced in very precise ways uh, back into the room from whence it came. Something else, like the board rubber, for instance, or the arm of this battered old armchair of mine, or the brick that our house is made of, for instance, uh, will tend to reflect some. Uh, that's how we know the colour of the bricks of our houses, for instance. It's reflecting some of the colour wavelengths back towards our eyes, and likewise the reverse side of this uh, whiteboard eraser, for instance, appears blue, uh, it's because it's only the blue end of the colour spectrum that's being reflected. The rest of it, the reds and the oranges and the yellows and the greens and so on, uh, are mostly being absorbed. That's why it looks blue. It's the same for these counters down here in different ways. The red looks red because preferentially that's the colour that's being scattered backwards by the uh, electrons of the atoms inside this, uh, uh, this disc and the rest are being absorbed. And we could say the same for everything that has distinct colour. Some things are absorbed, some things are scattered backwards. But what about glass then? Well, glass actually has the opposite property. The light that goes in it is scattered. It's scattered by the electrons within uh, the material that makes up the glass, but it is preferentially scattered forwards. So quite the opposite of our shiny metal. But it is a process of scattering the light. It's not passing, as it were, unhindered through the material. It's being scattered, but scattered in a forward direction. So it comes out the other side, in other words, or a lot of it does. But the fact that something is happening to the light going through, actually at the level of fairly fundamental physics, uh, is what's slowing the light down. So the speed of light as it goes through a sheet of glass, for instance, is less than the speed of light in, in air or in vacuum. Uh, and that, of course, if you look back at our um, video on the uh, visible spectrum, when we looked at how prisms split light up, for instance, that's what's driving that process. Because the different colours have their speeds changed by different amounts uh, in the prism that we looked at, or a water droplet, for instance, to create a rainbow. That's what bends the light. So it's a complex process. It's a complex process with the light uh, within the materials. But the light is scattered nonetheless in one way or another. Now, the trick, if that's the right word for glass, is simply that uh, we have um, scattering that is, as I say, primarily in the forward direction, in the direction in which the light was travelling. But there'll be impurities in our glass. Uh, and that could be an air bubble, for instance, but it might also be other chemical elements. The elements that we've put in to, for instance, allow us to work the glass at lower temperatures or whatever that might be. So in others, other words, we don't get all the light going through uh, that landed at first on one particular face. And of course that's what we see when we multiply the distance, when we look end on uh, rather than looking through a thin sheet. And the rod in the middle, uh, as you saw in the clip earlier, uh, actually takes on colour. We certainly can't see through it. Uh, what we've got now is different wavelengths being scattered out sideways 
and that's leaving us with a material that has a distinct colour to it. The different types of glass around the uh, outside, one of them is uh, Pyrex for instance and the other is silica, a pure silica glass. Uh, and I showed you something about this as well in an earlier video. Um, and it's the reason that very pure, very well refined uh, glass is used in fibre optic communications for instance. This soda lime glass in the middle and the rod that's showing up as a sort of really quite dark green colour um, would be useless in a fibre optic cable because it would just absorb all the light that's going through it with all the important signals uh, that are being transmitted. So we need something that's incredibly pure that is not scattering our light uh, sideways at all but causing it to continually go forwards. And that's why it took so very long to develop a glass that was capable of, of um, carrying signals over large distances. It wasn't in fact until the early 1970s uh, that a chap called Donald Keck in the United States actually uh, managed to formulate a glass that he could create into a fibre that would carry signals without serious loss over many kilometres. So it's the last half century really that has seen the globe circled with fibre optic cables um, essentially driving all our communication infrastructure. And it was the race to find um, a commercially viable, pure, uh, mostly silica glass um, that enabled that revolution in our communications technology. So glass is a fascinating material. It's extremely useful. Um, everything from windscreens to window panes and so on. Uh, and through to modern communication technology. Now although glass can be transparent and in a window and in a car you would expect uh, that to be perfectly so, we can colour it. So this chunk of glass for instance um, has had a rather special metal added to it called erbium. Uh, and that gives it its, this sort of um, pinky colour. Uh, this actually comes from a very high powered uh, laser, nothing to do with the sort of work that I did. Uh, it was given to me after it became damaged, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, and in fact, colouring glass becomes um, a skill in adding metals in one form or another. So for instance we can add iron uh, to glass. This is a fairly low concentration of iron and you can see it's a sort of bluey green colour. Or we can put more iron in there so this is a high, uh, higher concentration uh, and we get a deeper colour. Um, very distinctly uh, blue with a greenish tinge. I'm not sure you can see that on the webcam. Uh, and we can do other things as well, for instance, so we could add more than one metal and then we get different colours again. Um, and, you know, if you've ever looked at coloured glass, what you're looking at is a, is a transparent glass, essentially, that's had added to it one metal or another, um, or a combination of metals to give it a particular colour. A lot of stained glass windows, for instance, will be based around and have been for centuries based around the use of uh, glass formulations with metal added. But the same principle holds true. Uh, the difference here is that we're getting uh, transparency of our glass um, changed depending on the wavelength or the colour of the light that's going through it. The basic physics has remained the same. But it gets even more clever if we look at what we can do uh, with the glass. So what I want to look at uh, is a graph that will show us something 
about its transparency. So let's plot something like transparency up here. This could be the percentage of light transmitted, for instance. But it's, it's transparency to all intents and purposes. So down here we have no transparency uh, and right at the top here um, we've got our perfectly transparent material, 100% of the light goes through. And along here we'll look at the colour of the light. So in scientific parlance this would be the wavelength of the light. But it's essentially the colour if we're looking at visible light. Now, for uh, our windows, for instance, or our car windscreens, whatever, uh, we want a very high percentage of light transmitted in the visible range. So uh, let's say this is the range of wavelengths associated with visible light. We want, we'll never get 100%, but we want something uh, that is close to 100% in that range. And our windows of our houses, the windscreens in our cars and lorries and so on, um, are pretty good at achieving this. We get quite a lot of light through, um, given the thickness of material that we've got to play with. But if we go outside the visible range, uh, we get, for instance, to invisible light. So we have infrared out here, for instance, which is essentially heat energy. Uh, out the other side, we'd have ultraviolet, which is what, of course, burns our skin if we're in the sun too long. And actually way out this way, uh, beyond infrared, we'd actually have um, in a region out here is where we'd find our microwaves, for instance. So if we're looking at windows in houses or windows in, in cars, we actually we don't want any ultraviolet coming through. You don't want to get sunburn sitting in your living room, for instance. So we need a glass that actually has very low transmission in those wavelengths. And likewise for infrared, we don't want to be in a greenhouse. We have very low transmission for infrared. But of course we all want to use our microwave phones still. So in fact, we need to get a little bit more sophisticated and have the transmission go up again when we get to microwaves. So this is a very complex arrangement that we want to manufacture for our domestic glassware. We want to better see through it, but we don't want a lot of heat to be going through it and we don't want to get our skin burnt with ultraviolet either. But we do want to be able to use our microwave phones. So we need to formulate a glass that's going to have all of these characteristics. And that's what modern glass does. Uh, window panes of old actually didn't have this sort of performance at all. In fact, they would let through ultraviolet. You could get burnt inside uh, a glass window pane. Um, but progressively over the years, the formulation of modern glasses has been changed and changed and changed such that we now get a profile that's much closer uh, to this sort of uh, graph that I've sketched out here. So glass can be very clever in its formulation. Um, it's an amazing material. We can tune it and fine tune it over and over again to get the sort of properties that we want and we need. And that's one of the things that makes it 
ubiquitous uh, in modern life and um, continues to be developed and put to use in new environments. It's an amazing material. Anyway, that's enough for now. Bye.